Join me in prayer. Father, what a joyful time of year this is, and we're so thankful for the many blessings that we enjoy, uh, the seasonal blessings, we're grateful for it. We thank you for the richness of the fellowship, the friendships that we have, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the flavors. We thank you for all of these things. I want to thank you, O Lord, for the children that stood in front of us earlier and sang We thank you for the promise of their lives. We thank you for the joy of seeing their faces as they grow and develop. And as they're singing songs to God, Lord, we all pray that you would take root in their hearts at an early age, that each one of them would cross over from death to life when the time comes, uh, that they will believe the gospel and trust in Christ for eternal life and walk in it, even from an early age. We thank you for their parents that are pouring the gospel in them. We thank you for William's testimony and how he was raised in a Christian home and heard from childhood, from infancy, even the the gospel. And we thank you for his testimony and the joy of seeing his uh, baptism and being reminded of the incredible work you've done in our lives. We're mindful also of the mission that you've sent us to in the world, that we are responsible for this generation, responsible for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to a people walking in darkness, uh, that we are given this great light the light of the gospel and of the truth and are able to testify. And I pray that you would give us power through the Holy Spirit and compassion, that we would be compassionate to those who are perishing, compassionate to those who are without hope and without God in the world, and that we would be able to use the the seasonal aspects and uh, the, the sights, the sounds, the decorations that I mentioned earlier as a springboard to the gospel. Father, I pray that you would help us to uh, reach out to co-workers and neighbors and people we just meet, uh, clerks and others that wish us happy holidays, just different ones that we're able to speak the truth of the gospel to. And Lord, we thank you for the text that Kenny just read. We thank you for the truth of the word of God. I pray that you would give me now a special anointing through the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news based on this ancient text. Lord, open our minds and our hearts now and open my mouth that all of us might be able to contemplate the greatness of the gospel and the blessings of Christmas and of the eternity that lays ahead of us through the the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 49. We study this marvelous text that you just heard read. Uh, Christmas probably is the biggest event of the calendar uh, every year, I would say it's the biggest holiday there, there is. Um, uh, a Gallup poll in 2019 says that 93% of Americans in some way recognize or celebrate Christmas. Uh, and it's not just here in America. It's something that uh, is, is a worldwide phenomenon. Over 2 billion people observe Christmas in some way worldwide, if not more. Uh, Christy and I were surprised when we were missionaries in Japan Uh, to see Christmas decorations going up in the malls there in Tokushima. Very surprised. So there's the the green and red, and there's all the Christmas, jolly old St. Nicholas and all that. Santa was everywhere. Um, And so there it was, Christmas in Japan. That was about 1% evangelical. Um, But there they were celebrating Christmas. I have a friend uh, who lives in the Persian Gulf, communicate uh, via Zoom from time to time and uh, told me that there are Christmas trees all over that Muslim nation. 99% of of the people there are are Muslim, and they uh, still have Christmas trees. Um, If you look a little closer, though, uh, we realize Christmas isn't as big as it should be. 71% of Americans say they don't look on Christmas as a religious holiday at all. Now, that's a huge percentage of people Uh, that see it in a secular sort of way. And we think that must be true of the billions around the world that stop working and that gather to eat and to drink and to celebrate in some way. And so we're aware of the fact that Christmas, however big it is, uh, needs to be a lot bigger. And that brings me to the text that we're studying today, Isaiah 49, in which it is said, by God to Christ, it is too small a thing dot, dot, dot. And I want to zero in on that concept. 
and link it to Christmas. Christmas is too small. It's smaller than it should be. However big it is, it is still too small. Now in the text, it is said it is too small a thing for you to save the Jews alone. Too small a thing. Now what an amazing achievement that would be. The salvation of the Jewish nation. And when Jesus Christ finally achieves it, what a great achievement that would be. At the end of human history, as I believe the mystery that Paul talks about in Romans 11, where he says all Israel will be saved, and I believe that that will come, that will be a climax to the long and torturous and painful journey that Almighty God has been on with his chosen people, the Jewish nation, the descendants of Abraham. But however great that will be, God says in this text, it is too small a thing. God intended a glory far greater than that, a multitude from every tribe and language and people and nation standing around the throne celebrating the salvation of God. And so the idea of my sermon today is captured in another place in scripture. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. To magnify means to make great or make greater. Now, we cannot make an infinite God any greater than he is, but he does need to be greater in our own estimation. That's where he is too small. That's where Christmas is too small, in our own minds, in our own estimation. And the word of God is the remedy. Look at the text again, Isaiah 49, 1 through 6. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing, yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Well, I believe that it is Christ speaking in this passage. He's summoning all nations to listen. Look at verse 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Now, I've already made the assertion, but we need to ask, who is speaking in these words? This person is speaking of himself and for himself. But he relates something he says that God says to him. The Lord says to him. The Lord spoke to me. So who is the speaker in this ancient oracle? Well, three possibilities. It is Isaiah the prophet himself speaking. Or it is the nation of Israel collectively having a certain role to play. That's kind of uh, home base of verse 3 where uh, the speaker uh, says the Lord calls him my servant Israel. Or it could be the Messiah, the Christ, speaking through the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, through the prophet Isaiah in the first person. Now, if we look at verse 6, this is a key. He says, it is too small or too light a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So the servant who is speaking here is someone who both restores the tribes of Israel and is also the light for the Gentiles. Well, there's no way that can be the sinful nation of Israel. Israel can't bring Israel back. So that, that's eliminated. And it's certainly not Isaiah the prophet, the man of unclean lips, He would never have arrogated to himself the statements made here. And the New Testament solves this question for us directly by quoting this passage and ascribing it directly to Jesus. Shortly after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Joseph and Mary took the baby Jesus to Jerusalem to be circumcised in fulfillment of the law of Moses. A prophet named Simeon was waiting for him. 
Moved by the Holy Spirit, he took the baby Jesus into his arms and said these amazing words in Luke 2. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory for your people Israel. So he calls them the light for the Gentiles or for the nations. So also Paul and Barnabas, when they're preaching in a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, quoted this and directly connected it to Jesus. In Acts 13, 47, this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you, singular, a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now they, Paul and Barnabas, didn't think that they were the light of the Gentiles, but they they were there at Pisidian Antioch on his behalf. And so the statement that that had been made to Jesus, I will make you a light for the Gentiles, they took as their marching orders, but it was Jesus that was the light for the Gentiles. So therefore, the speaker in Isaiah 49 is none other than Jesus, speaking long before he was incarnate by the Virgin Mary, speaking prophetically by the power of the Holy Spirit in the first person. Now, this shouldn't surprise us because he does the same thing in his most famous quotation of Isaiah. At the beginning of his public ministry in Nazareth, he went to his hometown, Nazareth. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he took the scroll of Isaiah, and he unrolled it to Isaiah 61. And he read these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, first person, because he has anointed me, Messiah, Christ means anointed one, to preach good news to the poor. And he went on and quoted more of Isaiah 61. Then he rolled up the scroll and sat down and he said, today in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. So I am the Messiah. I am the anointed one. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. But if you just read Isaiah 61, it's the same thing. It's an ancient oracle written in the first person. It's Jesus speaking prophetically long before he was born, by the Spirit of God. So we have that same kind of pattern here. And this is one of a series of what's known as servant songs, the servant of the Lord. There are four of them. Uh, these, uh, the four servant songs, sometimes the text speaks about the servant of the Lord, and sometimes the a servant song, the servant speaks himself directly. But these four servant songs give us a sense of the purpose of God in sending Jesus. And this is the thing that's so amazing. Isaiah was written more than seven centuries before Jesus was born. Uzziah died in the year 733 BC, a contemporary of of the prophet Isaiah. And so this is a long time before Jesus was born. And it gives us great confidence, doesn't it, to know that the whole plan had been written out in detail in prophecy long before Jesus was born. So we have these four servant songs. The first is in Isaiah 42 which depicts Jesus as a gentle savior. Isaiah 42, one through four. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. So the speaker there is God. He's speaking about the servant of the Lord, Jesus. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth, and in his law the islands will put their hope. That's the first of the four servant songs directly ascribed to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12. When it says the bruised reed he will not break and the smoldering wick he will not snuff out, it is speaking of Jesus' wonderful tenderness and skill in binding together broken-hearted sinners and saving them. He is a gentle and a loving savior and that's the first servant song. Uh, the, this servant song, Isaiah 49, is the second of the four and we're going to walk through it this morning. The third is in Isaiah 50. Again, it speaks in the first person. It speaks of the sufferings of the servant. And then the fourth, Isaiah 52 and 53, is the most famous of the four servant songs. Both of those last two, Isaiah 50 and Isaiah 52 slash 53, speak of the suffering servant of the Lord, the intense sufferings of the servant of the Lord culminating in the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus. Now, this servant song, Isaiah 49, will uh, depict Jesus as a messenger for the glory of the Lord to the ends of the earth, to take the greatness of God from small beginnings to a worldwide eternal kingdom. 
the glory of the Lord shining to the Gentiles. But it begins so powerfully as Jesus speaks in the text to the distant islands and nations to listen to his voice, calling on all peoples all over the world, across all time, to listen to him. So look at verse 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. So this verse shows the scope of God's saving plans. Christ is calling to the ends of the earth. Christ is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. All nations on earth are his, for the Father has given them to him. And he summons the islands. He summons the distant nations, the farthest places, the remotest locations. For example, the Inuit people of the Canadian Arctic, the semi-nomadic tribes, the cave dwellers of Papua New Guinea belong to him, the blonde-haired Norsemen, Descending descendants of the Vikings who now live in civilized and technologically advanced cities in Norway, the tall Dinka in South Sudan, perhaps the tallest tribe on earth. All of these distant lands and all the others are summoned by Jesus Christ, the King of all the earth, to listen to his voice. Listen to me. And he wants them to know the origin of his saving mission. It was by the call of the Father before he was born. So God called Jesus before and after his birth. Look again at verse 1. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. Jesus is unique in all of human history. He existed before he took on a human body. He's the only human being that chose to enter the world. He was called by his Father. And Christ's mission was determined in the mind of God before the foundation of the world, before God said, let there be light, before God created the heavens and the earth, this plan was established and determined in the mind of God. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20 says, we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. This is no new plan thrown together hastily at the end. But it was planned in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13.8 also speaks of the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. And it says in the text that God formed, sharpened, polished, and concealed Jesus. Look at verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So God prepared his son, the Lord Jesus. And he prepared the world for the coming of Christ. He orchestrated all of these things. Before the foundation of the world, God the Father shaped his plan for the world through the Son. Everything in the universe, visible and invisible, was created through the Son. John 1.3, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Colossians uses the same concept, the word through. Colossians 1.16, for through him or by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. So through him, by him, for him. Well, if that's true of the physical universe, how much more are the plans for the salvation of sinners from every tribe, language, people, and nation made through the Son, by the Father, through the Son. So God the Father agreed to save the elect through the blood of his incarnate Son before God made anything at all. Ephesians 1 says, For he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. So his people were chosen in Christ before the world began to end up holy and blameless in heaven. So that's all this preparation that was made before there even was a world, before Jesus was conceived and born. The preparation language was ascribed to the unfolding plan of God and then history unfolded. The calling of Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. The birth of Isaac by a miracle, by the miracle power of God. 
and then of Jacob, and then of the 12 tribes, and then the bondage, the slavery in Egypt, all of that, the exodus through Moses, then all that subsequent history of the Jewish nation, and also the detailed history of the Gentile nations as well. God orchestrated all of these things according to his plan and his purpose. You look at the history of Israel recorded for us in the Old Testament, the history of Israel under the laws of Moses, and their tragic, consistent rebellion against God, and their consistent idolatry, and their consistent resistance of the Holy Spirit, and the messengers, the prophets that came, and they would not listen, and their subsequent exiles by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and God's graciousness in allowing a small remnant of them to return to the promised land under Gentile domination and rebuild their lives, rebuild the temple and the city. And then the subsequent history of that small dominated nation in the times of the Gentiles, dominated by Gentile powers until the time of Christ. And then in the fullness of time, we're told, Galatians 3, at the right time, God sent his son, Jesus Christ. At just the right time, everything had been prepared. Everything had been shaped and prepared for that moment in time for Jesus to come. And so we see that preparation language. And then God prepared a body for Jesus. He prepared a body for him in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Jesus was a holy embryo. This is an infinite mystery, something we will never fully comprehend, but his body was prepared step by step. It was miraculously conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came over the body of Mary, But then it unfolded, it seems, in the natural way, like any other baby is knit together in his or her mother's womb. So the Virgin Mary was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the angel said. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary said, I'm a virgin. How can it be that I would have a baby? And that's how it happened, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The ordinary 23 chromosomes that would have come from a father came from the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. But other than that, it seems his body was formed step by step as the child develops in the mother's womb. Now, the text in Isaiah says that God made his mouth like a sharpened sword. Well before his mouth could be a sharpened sword, he had to have a mouth at all. His physical mouth and then the lungs that gave him breath so he could speak Indeed, every bodily system needed for physical life, God willed to give him by the power of the Holy Spirit, knitting his body together. But in the ordinary way, it seems, of human gestation. Psalm 139, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Well, that's David, the psalmist, talking about his own physical creation by God inside his mother's womb. But how much more is that true of Jesus? And again, Job spoke the same way of his own body being knit together. Your hands, uh, Job said to God, your hands shaped me and made me. Remember that you molded me like clay. Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Uh, Did you not clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? You gave me life and showed me kindness. Well, how amazing is that process anyway for every baby? But how much more significant is it for the incarnate Son of God? All the days ordained for Jesus were written in God's book before one of them came to be. And he was concealed, but this concealed Son of God was revealed at the right time hidden in the womb of the Virgin Mary like a polished arrow, it says, concealed in the quiver. Just as God's plan for the salvation of the world was hidden in the mind of God, but then suddenly revealed when Jesus broke on the scene. It says in Romans 16, it speaks of the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known. Ephesians 3, 9 also, this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Colossians 1, 26, the mystery that had been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. This mystery is Christ, the incarnate Son of God, the Savior of the world, our hope for glory. And Isaiah tells us that God concealed him in the shadow of his hand until the right time. 
Now, the language here in Isaiah 49 is military. Jesus' mouth is likened to a sharpened sword. He is likened to a polished arrow. Jesus was unleashed by God the Father as a weapon to destroy Satan's dark kingdom, to smash it to bits, to destroy it, to bind the strong man and to plunder his house and to destroy him eternally in the lake of fire. And by his own death, by Jesus' own death, to destroy him who held the power of death. In order to do this, God had to give him a human soul, infinite mystery, and house it in a human body, for that is what death is, the separation of the soul from the body. And God gave him blood, blood cells, to course through his body, blood vessels to carry that blood, so that at the right time he could shed his blood As an atonement for our sins. God gave him bones as the frame of his body. But he ordained that not one of them would be broken when he died on the cross. God gave him eyes to see the suffering of his afflicted sheep. He gave him ears to hear their cries of pain. And all of this God prepared for his son in the nine months that he was knitting him together in his mother's womb. And then he hid him once he was born. He hid him from Herod's satanic attacks. Herod sent soldiers to hunt him down and slaughter him in Bethlehem. But God concealed him and protected him so that he would not die. And the demons would have killed him in the 30 years while he was growing up. He was getting ready to be revealed publicly to Israel, but they were held at bay. They would not be permitted to come after him. They knew who he was, but he was protected and concealed. He was concealed from public view until the right time came for him to be manifested publicly to Israel. John the Baptist came as the forerunner, and he saw, in the days of his baptism, the days of his preaching, John saw Jesus come, the only perfect man that has ever lived, and he declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he said, I have seen and I testify that he is the Son of God. John the Baptist said his central mission was the unveiling of the hidden Son of God. John 1.31, the reason I came baptizing with water is that he might be unveiled or revealed to Israel. The time of concealing was over. It was time for him to be revealed. And think about the sharpened sword that was Jesus' mouth. How was Jesus' mouth like a sharpened sword? With the awesome power of the words that he spoke. By his words, demons were driven out instantly. They were terrified of his word. They fled from him. No human weapon could ever bring terror to demons or to Satan. Satan has no fear of any weapon that we form, no weapon system. Remember when we were going through uh, the book of Job and we talked about Leviathan? And I thought that he pictured Satan. Well, Leviathan in Job 41, it says, The sword that reaches him has no effect, nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron he treats like straw. Bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make him flee. Sling stones are like chaff to him. A club seems to him but a piece of straw. He laughs at the rattling of the lance. There's no weapon that human beings could make. No sword that we could fashion that Satan would tremble at. But the demons were terrified of Jesus. And they fled at his word. When the demoniac of the Gadarenes with 5,000 demons inside was confronted with Jesus, they ran to him and fell on the ground before him, begged him, that he would send them into the herd of pigs and not send them into the pit before the appointed time. He said one word in in the Gospel of Matthew's account, go, and they fled. It was the power of the word of Jesus over the demonic forces. Jesus' sword is terrible and swift and unbreakable against all his enemies. At his second coming, he is depicted as having a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Revelation 19, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And with his breath, he will slay the Antichrist, the most powerful and most wicked human being that will have ever lived in all of history. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and the splendor of his coming. I mean, all he'll have to do with the Antichrist is say, be dead, go to hell, and it'll be done. 
That's the power of the sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus. And how much more terrifying when he speaks to his enemies on judgment day, when all the nations are gathered before him and he sits on a glorious throne and he separates the people, all of them, one from another into two categories and only two as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he's going to say to the goats, to the lost, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That depart from me is his sharp sword cutting them off from himself and from life and from everything good that there has ever been or ever will be. That's the terror of the sharp sword coming from the mouth of Jesus. And yet, in an amazing way, his polished sharp sword heals us from our sins, much like a surgeon's scalpel is able to cut out the tumor. He's able to take out the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It's able to penetrate even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. On the day of Pentecost, the people heard the gospel and they were cut to the heart. They were pierced by it and saved because of that sharp sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. Now we come to a mystery and that is the apparent failure of Jesus' mission. Isaiah 49, 1 through 6 is indeed, if it is indeed the pre-incarnate Christ speaking of his mission in the world, what do we make of this one statement? In verse 4, I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. That sounds really discouraged, doesn't it? I put in all this time, I did all this labor and nothing has come of it. If this is still Jesus speaking, and it must be because the text continues in the same pattern, how could it be, at what point would Jesus say something like this? The mystery of the incarnation, the entire mission of Jesus follows the same pattern. Nothing visibly spectacular at first. Small, insignificant, not very glorious, and just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> Growing to a level we can scarcely imagine. Isaiah 53 speaks of this very thing in verse 2. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Now, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him is not impressive. When the King of kings and Lord of lords entered the world, it was in abject poverty and humility, born in a stable, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. When the shepherds went and saw him, they saw a baby wrapped up in cloths. That was it. When the Magi came, having been led by the star, they just saw a normal human baby. It had no majesty, no glory. It was just simple. And so throughout his ministry, he had no outward majesty, no radiant glory shining around him. He looked like an ordinary man and a very poor one at that. He had no place to lay his head. He had to be supported by a group of women who supported him out of their means. And this culminated in his arrest, in weakness. He didn't fight. He just went like a sheep to the slaughter. And his, and his disciples all deserted him and fled the moment that he was arrested. Jesus said they would do it. This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. They're all gone. His closest, most trusted allies, disciples that he had poured into for three years, they're gone. And the time of his death as he was dying on the cross and his blood was flowing out of his body, all he had to show at that moment for a worldwide awesome movement and a kingdom that would last for all eternity was his mother, some other women who are friends of the family and one of the 12 apostles, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was an eyewitness to his death. And that was it. The only perfect ministry there's ever been. The only perfect teaching and perfect miracles, all of that perfect example. And that's it. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Well, the seemingly gloomy statement shows how small the kingdom of Christ would have appeared at that moment. 
If any of us who are followers of Christ could be there at that moment, we would see what it looked like. And it didn't look like much. It certainly didn't look glorious. It certainly didn't look like it would conquer the world and last for all eternity. It started small, like Jesus' own body in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Microscopically small, so also the kingdom, which would one day conquer the whole earth and last for all eternity. But at that moment, all of those beautiful outcomes were in the hands of God. As he died, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I think we could go beyond and say, into your hands I commend my kingdom. Do something with this. And that's why in Isaiah 40, 49, 4, it doesn't last long, this seemingly gloomy statement. But I said I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain for nothing. Yet, what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Ask of me, and I'm going to give you the nations as your inheritance. You cannot measure the zeal that God the Father has to make much of what Christ did by dying on the cross. But at the moment of death, it seemed like a failure. And so therefore, like Jesus' body itself grew, Jesus' kingdom starts too small and moves out to its appropriate scope. And we see the eternal glory of Jesus' kingdom. The text speaks of a glory too small for Christ. Look at verses five and six. Now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So this is Jesus speaking by the Spirit through the words of Isaiah that Isaiah wrote down. He talks of his formation in the womb, the incarnation. Jesus would say, the same God who formed me, formed my body in the womb of the virgin, has glorious plans for me. Yes, the original mission was to the nation of Israel. Paul says plainly, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, salvation is from the Jews. He said to the Syrophoenician woman, I was sent only to the lost tribes of Israel. Now this text says Jesus' first mission was to bring Jacob back to God and gather Israel to himself. To restore Jacob and bring back the remnant, those of Israel that I have kept, that remnant. But that mission is too small. The Hebrew literally says it's too light, it's too trifling a thing. I've got bigger plans than that for you, Jesus. Bigger plans than that, however great that is. That Jesus, the eternal son of God, would be the tribal savior of only one ethnic group on earth. That is too small a thing. Why? Well, Romans 3, 29 and 30 says, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God, who will justify the circumcised through faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. One God for the entire world. One Savior. So therefore, it is too light a thing for Jesus to only be a Jewish Savior. He has a worldwide plan. God does. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. A light for the Gentiles. And that light directly equated with salvation. As Isaiah said earlier in Isaiah 9, the people walking in darkness have seen what? A great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You know, it says in the next verse, Isaiah 9, 3, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. We're going to have a bigger nation. He says in Isaiah 54, lengthen the tent ropes and the stakes and get a bigger tent. You're going to need a bigger tent, O Zion. So it's too small a thing for just the Jews. There are going to be some honorary members of the, of the family of Abraham by repentance and faith in Christ who are being grafted into this incredible work. It is too small a thing for it just to stay Jews only. So they rejoice before you as those rejoice at the harvest as those rejoice when dividing the plunder. It's a time of joy. And so Jesus is the light for the Gentiles, giving the light of truth Shining the light on yourself. 
the light of the truth about yourself, that you're a sinner who has violated the laws of God as I am, that you deserve hell, death is coming, you see the light of yourself and you come into the light because you're not afraid because you know what you're going to find there is a savior who is gentle and humble and you're going to find rest for your souls and salvation for your souls. That light is shining on you and you can see yourself clearly for the first time. But you can also see the light of the glory of God in Christ and he's beautiful and attractive and you want him. That's the light. As it says in Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. So Jesus is the light for the Gentiles who would bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth. And what is that but missions, friends? You may be wondering, why did you do Isaiah 49? It's like, I want to get to missions. I want to talk about missions. Well, pastor, you did that last week. That's true. I want to do it this week, too. It is important that we understand God's worldwide plan for the greatness of Jesus. Jesus is still too small. And his kingdom is still too small. It's bigger than it was yesterday, praise God. But it's still too small. And it's going to get bigger and bigger. More and more people and more and more conception of the greatness of Christ. And that process is going to go on for all eternity. Romans 15, I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. And again it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him all you peoples and again Isaiah says the root of Jesse will spring up one who will arise to rule over the nations and the Gentiles will hope in him so this time of year we collect money for missions through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering we have a greater focus on missions our minds drift away throughout the year we should be thinking about it daily throughout the year but this is a good time for us to recommit and reconnect think about sacrificial financial giving it is by offerings like this that missionaries are cared for, paid for, and able to stay on the field. And so let's be sacrificial in our giving. We do this so that we may finally realize God the Father's determination in Isaiah 49, 6, that Jesus would have the full glory of the salvation of the elect from every nation. As Revelation 7 says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And Isaiah 9 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his kingdom and of peace, there will be no end. So this kingdom is going to get bigger for all eternity. Not more people, procreation will be done. But in your estimation of the greatness of Jesus, you're gonna spend eternity learning just how infinitely glorious and great Jesus is. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? Close with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to study. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We pray, O Lord, that you would just be speaking very plainly. Like even now, O Lord, be speaking. Speaking to people who have yet to cross over from death to life. Let them hear the truth and let them know. They've heard the gospel multiple times this morning. Let them know that it is for them. That they would see in the light of the truth of the word of God that they need a savior and that Jesus is that savior. And repenting and trusting in him, find life in his name. And for all of us, O oh Lord, help us to be committed to shining that light in many dark places in the Raleigh-Durham-Chapel Hill area. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.